Well, our study this morning is uh, it's a continuation. This is a four-part series they made on the humanity of Christ. If you remember back in the, especially the 1980s, the 1990s, and even into the 2000s, this was a very hot topic in the Adventist church. In fact, it was splitting churches. And this study I made up is made from the book by Dr. Jean Zach Hure, who is one of our theologians and scholars in Europe. Uh, I'm not even sure if he's alive anymore. Even when I bought this book back in 1999, uh, he was retired, living in Switzerland, and a pretty elderly man at that time. But at any rate, the study we had, or have, on humanity is such a hot issue. And it even, even today, although we don't hear that much about it anymore, uh, Well, I got to do something? Oh. <laughs> Again, this thing's challenging me. Oh, there we go. I always go the wrong way. Uh, this is part two, a study on the humanity of Christ. Very important that we understand this. And there's a lot of Adventists that don't. You know, Jesus said himself in John chapter 8 and verse 32, the truth shall set you free, and if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. We need to understand our own teachings, our own doctrine of the church. And we're going to find out that uh, our, some of our leaders in the past didn't understand this issue very much. As Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine. We need to be established in our truth and what we understand and what we know. Because truth is very important, so we're not deceived by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting. Because we capitulated, and that's what this study is all about. In fact, that's what Dr. Zachar, uh, Gene Zachar's book was all about. We changed our position, and we're going to go into that in this series. Uh, a real position is not to be cloaked to please uh, the world's great men, and that's what we did. We capitulated and changed to appease uh, other theologians of another religion. And she also writes in Manuscript 14, I was shown in this vision, given me of the judgment, that God would send warnings, counsel, and reproofs. Some will take heed to their ways and seek the Lord, while others would follow their own judgment because it was more convenient and pleasing in their own natural hearts to do so. Before the judgment of God can come on any human being, there has to be a knowledge and a rejection of that knowledge. And God always sends warnings, counsel, and reproofs to everybody. But we all have the free will on whether which way we, we go. Well, if you remember in part one, which was in January, I'm sure you all can remember that. <laughs> January 11th, I think. I tease the people at Lena, you know, there, there's a lot of gray-haired people at Lena, and I tell them, since I know most of you can't even remember what you had for breakfast this morning, this is all going to be new to you, even if you heard it before. So. But one of the slides we had in our first part was Dr. Ralph Larson, who was the head of the Bible Institute in the Far Eastern Division. And what Elder Larson did is he, he went to Andrews University, and he went to the Ellen White Estate, and he wrote a book, The Word Made Flesh, 100 Years of Adventist Christology. Now, Christology is a study of who the person of Jesus is. And from 1852, now that's what, 11 years before we were even officially organized as a denomination, to 1952, the Adventist church was on the same page. Everyone had one belief, that Jesus took the nature of Adam after the fall. Uh, some 400 quotes by Mrs. White herself. So everything that we were writing, everything we were preaching for 100 years, we all had one position. Jesus took the post-nature of Adam, or the fallen nature of Adam. And for Mrs. White, the whole plan of salvation depends on the human nature of Christ. And indeed it does for us as well. And this is something that we need to understand. Now, this is from our first uh, part. Remember in that, we looked at a lot of scripture, a lot of statements from Ellen White. I carried this one over because I think it's so important how she responded to it. This is from the 1888 material, by the way, 
this is the only, let me just say this, at that general conference session in 1888, the humanity of Christ was not an issue. As I said, we were all on the same page, but because of the disdain and downright hatred that a lot of our leaders had for Jones and Wagner, and Jones and Wagner built their theology off the, that Jesus had to take Adam's fallen nature, sinful nature. He had to. So some are writing letters to Mrs. White, and this is one of them. Letters have been coming to me affirming that Christ could not have the same nature as man, for if he had, he would have fallen under similar temptations. That is still the position of most Christian churches today, evangelicals, even our Catholic friends. They all believe that Jesus could not have taken our sinful fallen position because if they would have, he would have had the sin. In fact, our Catholic friends, remember we studied this in part one, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, it said that when the time was right, God sent the Son made of a woman made under the law. And our Catholic, the Catholic scholars looked at that and says, we can't have Mary to be a sinner because that would mean Jesus was a sinner. So they came up with the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, which said Mary was all free from taints of the original sin. So this, we, are, we are very unique in this belief that Jesus took the fallen nature of Adam, and we'll see that as we continue. But I want you to notice how Mrs. White responded to this. If he did not have man's nature, he could not be our example. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, it says Jesus is our example. Now we have to be a little careful here because as we get to part three or four in the study, there is the example theory of the atonement. And that is, well, you know, if Jesus kept God's commandments, pull up our britches, we can do the same thing. And we can't. It's impossible. Jesus was our example and shown us. Jesus, remember, did not come to show us what a God can do. He came to show us what a man can do, controlled by God, by emptying himself of himself, by completely being submissive and giving himself totally and completely to the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that gave Jesus the victory in the wilderness experience. It was the Holy Spirit that all through Jesus' life gave him the victory up until he went in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then he went on alone. But up until that time, it was the Holy Spirit. That same Holy Spirit is offered to you and me today. And as we talked about uh, in part one, Malachi 3.6, I am God, I change not. Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same today and yesterday and forever. God never changes. The Holy Spirit never changes. So that same Holy Spirit that gave Jesus a victory is now offered to you and I. And that way, he is our example. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, that emptying of self. So we'll look at that theory, example of, of the atonement. I think it's part five or four, but it might be three. But at any rate, if he did not have man's nature, he couldn't be our example. Then she goes on, if he was not partakers of our nature, he could not have been tempted as man. And Chuck read that for us this morning in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we do not have a high priest that can not be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in how many points? All points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. All points. Whatever sin so easily besets us, Jesus was there first. When, when the spirit prophet or the scripture says all points, it means all points, not some points, all, every kind of sin. Jesus was tempted in and yet without sin. And then she concludes, if it were not possible for him to yield a temptation, what does she mean by that? Jesus could have sinned. If it was not possible for him to sin, then he he could not be our savior, basically is what she's saying. It was a solemn reality that Christ came to fight the battle as man in man's behalf. He had to come as us, not vicariously, and we're going to look at that in a minute. His temptation and victory tells us that humanity must copy the pattern. Uh, man must become a partaker of the divine nature. And since we, none of us can change ourselves, that can only be accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit. And again, by submit, submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit. So this is pretty important that we understand this here. So the Holy Flesh Movement. So now we're going to begin part two. And this is kind of a review from part one. We're going to go into part two now. So before we do that, we need to pray.
Our Father in heaven, again, Father, we come to you seeking truth. And it is certainly our prayer, Father, that your Holy Spirit be present, that he will lead and direct in this study. As always, Father, may he take control. May he open our hearts and our minds to understand your wonderful truths. And certainly, Father, may our eyes always be focused upon Jesus. And we just praise you and thank you so much for him. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, the Holy Flesh Movement. And it's important that we understand what happened here. This movement was born in the Indiana Conference churches between 1898 and 1899, founded by Pastor Evangelist S.S. Davis. This teaching soon carried away the president of the conference, Aris Donnell, and several other pastors. So it became a very popular teaching. Confronted with the development of this belief in the church as a general conference brethren, or leaders, thought it was wise to send Brother Stephen Haskell and A.G. Breed to check out this new belief. Stephen Haskell was shocked. He was horrified by what he saw. So we need to understand now just what is the Holy Flesh Movement because we're committing the same sin. Contrary to Orthodox Adventist Christology, what is Orthodox Adventist Christology? What position is it? That Jesus took the nature of Adam after the fall, after sin. Okay? But contrary to that, this strange doctrine, and that's coined by Mrs. White herself, asserted that Christ had taken Adam's pre-fallen nature and that he therefore possessed holy flesh. So the holy flesh movement then was that Jesus took the nature of Adam before the fall. Keep that in mind because we're going to come back to it. Based on this premise, it was claimed possible to procure the same holy flesh by following Jesus in his experience through the Garden of Gethsemane in the manner... uh, in the manner those who follow the Savior could reach a corresponding state of physical sinlessness and obtain a translation face similar to that of Enoch and Elijah. So the Holy Flesh movement, the whole premise was that Jesus took the Adam of nature before the fall. That's in line with evangelical. That's what they believe. That is not what Seventh-day Adventists ever believed until this happened. Ellen White replies right away to Haskell, so seriously did she judge the situation that uh, she replied immediately. Her letter dated October 10th, 1900, established a firm and clearer stand against the teaching of the Holy Flesh Movement, which she defined as strange doctrine. She coined that. Erroneous theories and methods and wretchedness invented of human ideas prepared by the father of lies. Who's the father of lies? Satan is. So she's saying that this holy flesh movement, which is predicated on Jesus taking the nature of Adam before the fall, was prepared by Satan. So we're going to come back to that. So we need to remember that. Uh, The holy flesh movement was the first attempt to introduce into the Adventist church a doctrine radically opposed to its teaching up until that time. It was Wagner who the General Conference sent to refute the movement and was invited to the 1901 General Conference session. And I thought this, I put this in here uh, about Jones and Wagner because I I think it's very important that we understand this. If what Jones and Wagner taught were erroneous or wrong, Ellen White would have corrected them just as she corrected uh, those of the Holy Flesh movement and the semi-Aryan belief. Now you remember in part one we studied about semi-Aryan, or Arianism means Jesus was created. And uh, Uriah Smith in 1865 wrote a book stating that, but he wasn't the only one that believed that. James White believed that. Uh, Captain Joseph Bates believed that. Jane Andrews believed that. Uh, Wagner, the father of E.J. Wagner, believed that. Many others. Because a lot of, uh, after the, the disappointment of 1844, a lot of the be- believers came out of the Methodist church but quite a few of them come out of uh, congregational churches, and they were semi-Aryan. They didn't believe that Jesus preexisted or the divinity of Jesus. 
In fact, that was an issue at the 1888 General Conference. It was on the agenda. It wasn't an issue. Let me rephrase that. It was on the agenda. I have another study, uh, and I don't mean to make this sound like commercial, coming up after this, what really happened in 1888. But that was another uh, item that was on the agenda, the divinity of Christ. Was Jesus created, or was he always with God? Now, we can look back. You know, we got John... Chapter uh, 1, verses 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We have uh, Colossians 1, 15 and 16 saying the same thing, that Jesus always uh, was. We got Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, that the words were created by Jesus. you got to wonder how these guys uh, got into this belief. And I think Dennis Forte from the seminary at Andrews at camp meeting a few years ago did an excellent job in explaining that. They just simply never challenged it. They just accepted it. Well, we as Seventh-day Adventists, some, we just accept things that the church leaders say, you know, without challenging. So it's, there's no difference. It took Mrs. White to straighten them out. Even uh, James White, her own husband, in uh, Desire of Ages, she said, in Christ is life underived, unborrowed. He always was. He was the beginning and the, the last. Always was, always will be. So he was there at creation. So I thought that was important. Uh, what Ellen White said, Ellen White herself expressed, after hearing Wagner, and this was at the 1888 General Conference, the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ had been set forth among us with beauty and loveliness. When Jones and Wagner presented their position at, at the 1888 General Conference <coughs> in Minneapolis, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> E.J. Wagner got up and says, we believe in the divinity of Christ. He was God. And that was a radical statement at that time, but certainly Jesus is God. Uh, for her, for, <clears throat> for Mrs. White, it demonstrated that God, <clears throat> God excuse me. <clears throat> I'm going to steal one of these bottles of water from you guys. I assume that's why they're up here. For her, it demonstrated that God was at work <clears throat> among uh, Wagner and interpretation, was for the most part uh, the th theological demonstration of what she had always believed and stated in her writings up to that time. <clears throat> okay, now, now we go, uh, well, this is important too. Uh, I, I need to explain this. I look, you know, like I, I made this up 20 years ago almost, and if I was doing it today, I would do it a lot different. <clears throat> now, this thing doesn't flow well at all. It flows like mud. And <clears throat> I'm kind of all over the place. <clears throat> Jesus Christ reproduced and multiplied. By doing that, and after I read this, I, by doing what? J, you idiot. By doing what? So I need to explain that. By doing that, by the Son of God becoming the Son of Man, by taking on himself our fallen nature... And in the same fallen nature that you and I have, he condemns sin, and he qualified to be our Savior, okay? So by doing that, that's what that means, all that. He, Jesus, established the will of God in the flesh. <clears throat> God manifested in the humanity of Christ his righteousness, his will. And so that way, Jesus became our example to show us that by doing that, he established the fact that God's will may be done in any human sinful flesh. In your sinful flesh, in my sinful flesh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. But first of all, this wonder must be worked out in, the sinful, sin, in sinful man. Not simply in the person of Jesus Christ, but in Jesus Christ reproduced and multiplied in millions of his followers. Do you understand the importance of that statement and why <clears throat> it's so important that Jesus take on our sinful fallen nature? He came and showed us that even in, in, in with the sinful fallen nature, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the righteousness of Christ can be reproduced in our life. Christ our righteousness by faith. And it's only by faith that we can obtain that. Okay? Does everybody understand? Because that is important that we understand that. Okay, now we're back. That's why I said this thing doesn't flow well at all. Wagner's message and Ellen White's testimony 
were heeded. As early as the next day, the two main leaders of this movement, the Holy Flesh movement, R.S. Donnell and S.S. And S. Davis, uh, confessed their error in front of approximately about 300 in attendance. Unfortunately, in 1905, Donnell was readmitted to the ministry, whereas Davis was indefinitely excluded from it. He ultimately left the Adventist church and joined the Baptist church. Along with, uh, just before this, with Dudley Cantwright, another one of our eminent speakers, left the Adventist church and became a Baptist. So, it all began. <clears throat> I, uh, <clears throat> what we're going to do now, I just wanted to establish what the Holy Flesh Movement was. Now we're going to fast forward it, not a lot, a time, some 55 years, a couple of generations, from 1900 to 1955, because that's where it started in 1955, and that's where a lot of our theology today might be. Some of you might believe what we're going to study, and I hope not. The new theology that came in. It all began in, it all began in January 1955 when a statement appeared in an evangelical periodical, Our Hope, declaring that the Seventh-day Adventist Church disparaged the person and work of Christ in teaching that Christ in his humanity partook of our sinful, fallen nature. Now, I had to look up that word, disparage, and it means regard or represent as being as little worth. So the evangelicals believe, because we're saying Christ took the nature of Adam after the fall, that we're making little worth of what Jesus did. Actually, the opposite is true. Uh, this, this point of view by Schuyler English, editor of our periodical, was that Christ did not partake of the fallen nature of, as other men. And again, that's an evangelical belief. And most of Christianity that Jesus had to take the nature of Adam before the fall. Otherwise, he would be a sinner. And that's not what Seventh-day Adventists believe at all. Well, Leroy Edward Froome, uh, he's one of the main players here. In 1955, it was Froome, along with Roy Allen Anderson, that met with Walter Martin and Donald Barnhouse. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let's find out who Froome is. He had secured undisputed recognition as a research scholar and historian. His four-volume, Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, and other books had contributed greatly to his reputation. So he's one of our big guns. He's a well-honored well one of our uh, scholars and theologians. <clears throat> and Froome wrote the English. Froome immediately wrote to English, noting that he was mistaken. He said that English had been misled by an older edition of Bible readings for the home circle. Well, that concerned me. If we had always had one position, how can he say that there was an older edition of uh, Bible readings for the home? Did we make a change there? And when I studied that out, the narrative of the study never changed. We use the same scripture. It's always been the same, proving that Christ took the nature of Adam after the fall. But in an editorial note, in, uh, in the late uh, mid-50s, we changed it. it. We said, and I, I can't quote a verbatim, but it went something like, when the Son of God became the Son of Man, he took our fallen, comma, sinful nature. Well, in the new editorial, everything stayed the same, except there was no comma, and, sin, no, and it never said sinful nature. He just took our nature. And as, as insignificant as that was, that was enough where Froome convinced English that Jesus did not take our sinful, fallen nature. You, you understand that? And that was just in an editorial. It wasn't in the study. If any of you got Bible readings from the home, you open it up and you go on the nature of Christ. You're going to see all the scripture there. That's, that's never changed. At the end of the correspondence, English was convinced that he had been mistaken and issued a correction in the magazine Our Hope. So Froome convinced them he was wrong. Eternity Magazine. After his initial contact with English, Froome was introduced to Donald Gray Barnhouse. Dr. Barnhouse was a Presbyterian uh, pastor and editor of Eternity of Philadelphia, which is Eternity Magazine. I don't think that's any longer in publication. I, I don't think. But we're going to come back to Eternity uh, Magazine. 
Froome was also introduced to Walter Martin, a Baptist theologian who was eager for information about Adventists so he could wrap up his book, The Truth About Seventh-day Adventists. Walter Martin was also writing another book uh, about this time, or a few years later, called The Kingdom of the Cults. Now, at this time, Walter Martin did believe we were a cult. It was Barnhouse who said, well, they may be, but you at least owe these people a visit. You've got to go at least talk to them. And if they're a cult, then you can put them in your book that way. You know. So there was a meeting that uh, took place, and Walter Martin and, and uh, Donald Gray Barnhouse sent his son Gary Barnhouse with them. And he thought it would be like an hour or two-hour meeting, and this thing would be resolved and settled. And, but that's not what happened at all. From 1955 to 1956, a series of 18 conferences took place between evangelicals and Adventists for the purpose of discussing the doctrine of the Incarnation. That was the big issue, the nature of Christ. It was not the only issue. Walter Martin did not agree or accept the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White. He did not accept the Sabbath. As a typical evangelical, the Sabbath and then even the teaching on the sanctuary, that was given to the Jews. That was part of the Old Covenant. They were, they were under the dispensation of the law. We are now under the dispensation of grace. But he was willing to overlook those, but there was four things that he would not overlook. And we studied this before. Do you remember what they were? There was two of them where I agreed with uh, Dr. Martin on. Number one... Walter Martin said or we, that we believe that we are saved by grace plus obedience to God's commandments. We are not saved by our obedience. We are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Our obedience to God's commandments is the proof or the evidence that the Holy Spirit is working with us. So I agree with Walter Martin on that one. The other one was that Christ was created. Jesus was not created. From the beginning, he had always been. He's part of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I thought That one surprised me because I thought by 1955, we'd have all our ducks in order and all our marbles in the same bag or whatever metaphor you want to eat, use, but evidently we didn't. The two I disagreed with Mr. Martin on was, one, the incarnation. This, this is with the hottest topic. And the other one was that at the cross, the plan of the salvation or the atonement was not complete. What was complete at the cross? Think in terms of the sanctuary, the sacrifice. John 1, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. What else do we need besides his sacrifice at the cross? Chuck read it for us this morning. We need Jesus as our high priest. He's now applying his blood. He's bringing his blood, not the blood of goals and boats, but his blood into the holy place. So Mrs. White, especially in the great controversy, said we need both. And because evangelicals reject the doctrine of the sanctuary, and all the sanctuary is is God's show and tell from beginning to end, the whole plan of salvation. Uh, so those, those were four where Mr. Martin wouldn't budge on. So we did, unfortunately. The Adventists affirmed, <clears throat> when the topic of Christ's human nature was presented, the Adventist representatives, now that would be uh, Ellie Froome and Roy Ellen Anderson, affirmed, according to Barnhouse's report, that the majority of the denomination had always held, now this is significant, the hum humanity assumed by Christ to be sinless, holy, and perfect despise the fact that a certain of their writers had occasionally got into print with con, uh, contrary views completely repugnant to the church at large. That is not a true statement. As we talked about in part one, and we talked about with Ralph Larson in his book, The Word Made Flesh, for a hundred years we were all on the same page, that Jesus had taken the fallen nature of Adam. So for our representatives to say something like this, it's just it's deception and a basic lie. Some lunatic fringe. According to this report, the Adventist representatives disclosed to Walter Martin that they had among their numbers certain members 
of their lunatic fringe. Obviously, the Adventist representatives gave the impression that there were some irresponsible lunatics who had written that Christ had taken upon himself fallen human nature. This is from Ellie Froome. So according to Froome's definition, I'm a lunatic. Please leave it alone. <laughs> if my brother was here, he'd be hollering, amen. <laughs> but there are, that too is not a true statement. There wasn't a few, most of us. Most of Adventists believe Jesus took the fallen nature of Adam. When we get to part three, we're going to see a pushback. And there was a lot of pushback from other leaders in the church. The new interpretation. While those meetings were taking place, it was agreed that the results of the discussion would be published simultaneously in official period periodicals of both groups. For the evangelicals, it would be Eternity Magazine. For us... It would be Ministry Magazine. The New Adventist Interpretation was published in Ministry Magazine in September 1956. One year later, in the autumn of 1957, the book Question on Doctrines was released under the general title, Councils of the Spirit of Prophecy. The New Christology. In support of the New Interpretation, eight pages of Ellen White quotations were carefully selected and that's important. They were carefully selected to define the nature of Christ at the Incarnation. There is not a single reference to the Bible text. This was a new slant on a subject, for up until that time, the discussion had been founded largely on Scripture. Why do you think we made that change? Because we could not manipulate Scripture, but we could the writings of Ellen White. That's why they were carefully selected. Roy Allen Anderson, again, uh, was secretary of the Ministerial Association of the General Conference and chief editor of uh, Ministry Magazine. I want to say here, right now, uh, these aren't bad men. They're not evil men. They're, they're good men, but they wanted, they wanted to be accepted by the evangelical world. But our doctrine is so different, you can never ham harmonize it. But that's what they wanted to do. So, and I believe they were controlled by Satan, and I'll show you that in a minute here. As were our leaders in 1888, Mrs. White says right out, they were controlled by Satan. But they weren't evil men or bad men. I've been controlled at, by Satan at times. We all have. So I, I don't want to give you the impression that they're evil men or bad men. I, I don't want to give that. I heard a lot of flack over that. Okay. Anderson declared also that in only three or four places in all the inspired counsel of Ellen White does she use such expressions as fallen nature or sinful nature. Well, that's just not true. Elder Larson in his book showed that was over 400 quotes by Mrs. White saying that Jesus had to take our fallen nature. We're going to look at a couple here in a minute. So again, this is just blatant lying and uh, deception. Anderson insisted, Anderson insisted the difference between the first Adam and the second Adam was not one of nature, but rather a simple difference of situation. Well, of course, that's true. I mean, the first Adam was in the Garden of Eden, in holy bliss and paradise. When Jesus came, and remember the statement in Desire of Ages on page 49, where Mrs. White says it would have been almost infinite humiliation for Jesus to take the place of Adam even before the fall. But Jesus accepted the humanity of man after 4,000 years of sin. And like every child of Adam, he was uh, uh, under the hereditary, the work law of hereditary. I mean, clear statement, so. So certainly, you know, what Anderson is saying, the difference in situation, that's true but not of their nature. The environment in which Jesus lived was tragically different from Adam's. Well, yeah. And Anderson concluded our sins were imputed to him and vicariously, and that's the new theology. And there's a lot of Adventists. In fact, I counted 15 different Adventist authors who wrote books in favor of the new theology. He took our sinful fallen nature and died in our stead vicariously. Not, in other words, he really didn't become one of us. 
All was taken vicariously. This expression is indeed the magical formula contained in a new interpretation. According to the authors of Questions on Doctrine, that's the book that we put out, it is in this sense that all should understand the writings of Ellen White when she refers occasionally to sinful, fallen nature of Christ. Again, that is not true. She didn't occasionally. That's all, the only position Ellen White ever had. The authors published in the book's appendix, now this is the book, Question on Doctrine, some 66 quotes from Ellen White divided into sections with subtitles such as Took Sinless Human Nature or Perfect Sinlessness of Christ Human Nature. And of course, such phrases were never written by Ellen White. So there's some deception going on here. The new milestone of Adventism Number one, Christ took Adam's spiritual nature <clears throat> before the fall, his sinless human nature. Now, let's go back to 1900. What was the Holy Flesh movement? Just that, that Jesus took the nature of Adam before the fall. And who does Mrs. White say came up with this? The father of lies, Satan. Here we are, just 55 years later, we're taking the same position again. You know, you would think these guys would go back and look at our history. Christ inherited only the physical consequences of the sinful nature. The difference between Christ's temptation and Adam was solely in the difference of environment and circumstances. And Christ bore the sins of the world vicariously, not in reality. And I can show you that in the Bible commentary where you, in some of the quotes that the New interpretation, the new theology. Questions on doctrine. On the eve of its appearance, Anderson proclaimed in Ministry Magazine as the most wonderful book ever published by the church. Well, I take issue with that. Because you think a conflict of the ages, desire of ages, the great controversy, patriarchs and prophets, prophets and kings, acts of the apostles, how can he even make a statement like that? But he's entitled to his opinion. Presented as it was, the apparent seal of approval of the General Conference, it was shown that the General Conference was behind this. They weren't. And when we get to part three, which I think is in December, we're going to see the pushback, and there was a lot of pushback. Presented as it was with the apparent seal of approval of the General Conference. The book, Seventh-day Adventist, Answer Questions on Doctrines, that was the full title of the book, was widely distributed in seminaries, universities, public libraries. Thousands of copies were sent to members of the clergy as well as to non-Adventist theological professors. We made a change and we wanted the world to know about it. Though almost 140,000 copies published had a distinct influence both outside and within the Adventist church, and boy, they sure did. And then when we get to part three and four, you see that. Well, we can't leave until we discuss the Baker letters. Anybody, ever, did you, anybody here hear the Baker letters? No? Well, I sure, sure did. When I was making this up, I had well-meaning people tell me, because of the Baker letter, we shouldn't even be talking about this. And if you remember in part one, the quote, where Mrs. White says that the, divinity, the humanity of Christ is everything to us. It is a golden chain that divines our humanity with his divinity. And she says this is to be our study. Her words, not mine. But the Baker letters, 1895 and 1896, as I said before, as Seventh-day Adventists, we have always been on the same page. God, Jesus only took one position, the position of Adam after the fall. At 1888, Jones and Wagner built their, their theology on that. But that was pretty well accepted. But it wasn't really understood. In 1895 and 96, there were watershed years for the Adventist church because there was a lot of discussion now on the humanity of Christ. But then as today, there's a lot of people that won't fully understand it and there was a lot of mistakes being made. And so I'm going to share with you the Baker letters here, or part of it anyways. 
First, we've got to find out who Baker was. William L. H. Baker, in 18, 1895, while she was still in Australia, remember, this prior to this, in the early 1800, uh, 1890s, the General Conference broke up the trio. They sent Mrs. White to Australia, and she told them right out, the Lord is not in this. The Lord would not have me leave Battle Creek at this time. But in a vision that the Lord gave her, he said, you go, Ellen, because I have a work for you to do there. And she did do a wonderful work. Uh, they sent Wagner to England, and they kept Jones here. But in 1895, when she was still in Australia, Ellen White wrote a long letter of encouragement to William Baker, who was in charge of the work in Australia, uh, Tasmania, and New Zealand. Before leaving the United States for Australia, Baker had worked at Pacific Press in California from 1882 to 1887, and for four years he was Wagner's assistant. And in 1914, he was appointed professor of Bible at Avondale College in Australia. So that's a little bit of his history and who he was. Now we need to look at the letter that Ellen White wrote to him. This letter to Baker comprised of 19 handwritten pages of which two entire pages are devoted to errors to be avoided in the public presentation of the human nature of Christ. As I said, there was a lot of talk, a lot of discussion now on, on the nature of Christ, but there was a lot of stakes being made. And I made a few of those mistakes. And one of them is we should never say that Christ had a sinful nature because you are implying that he had to sin. We are to say that he took, or he was made. It was alien, it was foreign to him. So I mean, this is just an example. I'm going to show you here what Mrs. White said. She writes, be careful, exceedingly careful, as to how you dwell upon the human nature of Christ. Do not set him before the people as a man with the propensities of sin. What does she mean by that? Why shouldn't we present Christ with the propensities of sin? Because he never sinned. To have a propensity to sin means you would have had to sin first. And Jesus never sinned. Propensity means, by the way, an inclination or natural tendency to behave in a particular way. So since Jesus never sinned, he could never have a propensity to sin. You and I have propensities to sin. We sin, but not Jesus. So that was one of the mistakes being made. We're only going to look at a couple here. Number two, she writes, Let every human being be warned from the ground of making Christ altogether human, such as one, such, such a, and as one of us ourselves, for it could never be. Why can't it be? Why can't he be just like us? Well, not only was he divine, he never sinned. We're sinners. So in that regard, he isn't exactly like it. We should have no misgiving in regards to the perfect sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. Now those in favor of the new interpretation, he thought this was a smoking gun. But we need to understand this, this comment. We should have no misgivings in regards to the perfect sinlessness of the human nature of Christ. What does she mean by that? Well, Romans 8.3 for what the law could not do, what can't the law do? It can't save you. It can also cannot produce righteousness in sinful flesh, where the Holy Spirit can. All the law can do is point out that we're sinners in need of a salvation. And then it condemns us. First, first Corinthians 15, 56, for the strength of sin is the law. Sin gets its authority from the law to condemn us. It's God's law condemning you and I to eternal damnation, and just fully so. We're sinners. We've broken it. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, so whose flesh is Paul talking about here? Your flesh and my flesh, right? There's not one of us that can of ourselves keep God's Ten Commandments. That word, do you remember what that word flesh is in the Greek? Sarts, S-A-R-X. And sarts always means fallen flesh. So, weak through the flesh, he's talking about us. We're the problem, not God's law. God's laws are holy, just, and good, and right as God himself is. The problem is not with God's law, it's with us. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And guess that word flesh there 
Guess what it is? Sarks. And it's talking about Jesus' flesh now. And on account of sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. That is huge. God did not sit on his throne in heaven and make a, a judgment or a proclamation condemning sin. God himself came in the person of his son, and in the same flesh we have, he condemns sin in the flesh. That's absolute. There's 500 sermons in that one text. I'm just not smart enough to get them all out. There is so much going on in there. He condemns sin in the same kind of flesh we have. So for us to sit and make excuses for sin, and Mrs. White says there is no excuse for sin. We all have the power of the Holy Spirit available to us if we would tap into it. So that's what she's saying. In his flesh, Jesus was sinless. He never sinned. He, he condemned sin in the flesh. Here's a couple of statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. This is show you Mrs. White is not talking on both sides of her mouth. Scripture never... Uh, uh, What's the word I want to use? Pardon? It, 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 it doesn't say one thing and then another. Counterdict, that's, thank you, Brad. That's the word I was looking for. It was in the order of God that Christ should take upon himself the form and nature of fallen man. Remember in part one, William Johnson who was uh, editor for the Review and Herald at the time. He wrote a book, Absolute Confidence. He's supposed to be one of our uh, scholars on the book of Hebrew. And he said there's only a couple places in Scripture where it really talks about Jesus taking the sinful nature of Adam. And that's not true at all. And he says, well, he had our form, but he didn't have our nature. Here's a quote right here. In fact, this is from our study in part one. Not only did he have a form, he looked was human, but he took the nature of fallen man, that he might be made perfect through suffering. And that's Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. And that's in 1864. That's just a year after we were officially organized as a denomination. Then in 1874, she writes, The great work of redemption could be carried out only by the Redeemer taking the place of fallen Adam. It doesn't get any clearer than that. So for people to come around and say, as Fruman did in 1955, that Jesus vicariously took our nature, that he didn't have the fallen sinful nature. They're going right against the spirit of prophecy. And there's Adventists who believe that today. In favor of the new interpretation, this letter, like many other private letters, was never published in testimony for the churches. Preserved in the archives of the E.G. White estate, this letter was not known by researchers until 1955. What else happened in 1955? Froome met with Walter Martin. After it was discovered, the supporters of the new interpretation realized that its content appeared to condemn the traditional position. So... They thought they had a smoking gun. Well, that's just because of just this one statement. That's like we're playing baseball, and Greg has 400 home runs because Elder Larson said Mrs. White made some 400 statements where he took our sinful fallen nature. He has 400. I got one, but I won the game. That's basically what they're saying. They think they got the smoking gun here. George Knight. Now, I usually don't agree with Mr. Knight, but I do on this one. According to Knight, two factors motivated the theological change in the 1950s. One was the discovery of, in 1955 of the Ellen White letters to W.L.H. Baker, and the other was the sensitivity of certain church leaders, Ellie Froome and Roy Ellen Anderson, uh, to the criticism of certain evangelicals, Walter Martin and Donald Barnhouse, that the Adventist sinful tendency Christology was less than adequate. In other words, they could not accept that we believe Jesus had to take the fallen nature of Adam. Up and through this time, the denomination writers had been fairly well in harmony with Jones and Wagner and Prescott that Christ had come in human flesh like Adam after the fall. These statements, the Baker of statements, have played and still play a decisive role in favor of the new interpretation. 
This new interpretation did not go unnoticed or unchallenged, and boy, it sure didn't. And, and when we get to part three, we're going to look at the pushback. And there was a lot of pushback uh, by a lot of our theologians and scholars. But somehow this book still, they railroaded the book through. And this is our last slide here, and I love this one. Mrs. White says that uh, the nature of God, whose law had been transgressed, and the nature of Adam, the transgressor, met in Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man. Isn't that a wonderful statement? God's law who had been transgressed. Jesus was the Son of God. By Adam, the Son of Man, both of these sons. Jesus had two natures. He had the divine nature, and he took our fallen sinful nature. So, I think that, any questions, thoughts? I know this is kind of long, and that is the last slide. Uh, like I said, when we get to part three, I don't think part three is as long. But I might be wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, there's a lot here, you know. And, and like I said, 20 years ago when I made this up, it was a hot issue. And I had well-meaning people come up to me because of the Baker letter saying, no, you shouldn't even be talking about this. And I disregard that. You know, I, I had one man <laughs> tell me we should only read things put up by Seventh-day Adventists. And I told that person, if I believed that, I wouldn't be a Seventh-day Adventist today. So, but we do need to read with discernment. We, we have to have our full and our eyes open because there's, even from Review and Herald and Pacific Press, there's the new theology view out there. And we had speakers at camp meeting that uh, supported this new theology. It's important to understand because if how you see Jesus or how you see your God is how you're going to relate to him. And if you don't believe that he took our fallen nature and was our example, then you're going to start making excuses for sin. So we need to know that there's not only did Jesus forgive us of our sins, which is justification, that's for the whole world, but there's sanctification, which is only from God, and that's changing us, making us that new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. What, what's good would our God be? We couldn't have a God that... Pardon me? What good would God be to us if we can't claim that... Oh, absolutely. That's why Mrs. White... That very first slide I had, to, to Mrs. White, the whole plan of salvation evolved around the humanity of Christ. Because if he didn't become one just like us, how could he be our Savior? How could he even help us? So th this is an important study. Like I said, there's two school of thoughts today in Adventism. Because of this book, it all started in 1955. And when we get to part three, uh, it really mushroomed Desmond Ford. Desmond Ford was one of the first ones to recognize this, and he started bringing this to its final conclusion. That's part of it. We'll get to that later.